chapter 165, Attempt Escape. At this time, it was some brothers still down Lawton behind the wall, and they started a rebellion because as the prison was coming to a close, the conditions got worse, if that was possible. They were being fed one boiled egg and applesauce for breakfast at 4 a.m., a bologna sandwich for lunch at 12. Dinner sometimes came at 10 p.m. or it didn't come at all, and no canteen was available. They hadn't had a hot shower in eight months, and with the shortage of staff, because they were being fired or quitting, they were getting the required one-hour daily recreation once every two months, and their 15-minute shower once a week. They started a lot of fires, and the cell block that they were housed in was now inhabitable. Once the officers got control of the rebellion, they put them on a bus to be held at the Supermax block, South 1 at DC jail, where I was located. A few of them had handcuff keys. My homeboy Mario, who was a lifer, was sitting up front. Inside the prison bus, you are handcuffed in the front of your body and the cuffs are connected to belly chains which wrap around your waist. You're also shackled around your ankles. A locked gate also separated the prisoners from the guards. Two guards in the front, sometimes one in the back. As the bus pulled into the secure DC jail parking lot where prisoners are being received and discharged to other institutions, the brothers came out of their handcuffs. And with all of them being lifers or serving 90 to 100 year sentences, they had nothing to lose. As the officer opened the locked gate that separated them to begin taking them off the bus, the brothers pushed the gate open, knocked him out the way, and they all headed for the concertina wire laced 20-foot wall. Some of them still had on shackles and some only had on the belly chains. The homie Mario was able to take off the belly chains but not the shackles. The officers went into panic mode and the guard in the tower opened fire. Because there were so many prisoners scattered everywhere, the guard was shooting recklessly. One of the brothers made it to the top of the wall before he was shot. He fell off of the top of the wall landing into freedom, but broke both of his wrists and lost three teeth trying to break his fall. Another brother was so cut up and bleeding from the concertina wire that he couldn't go any further. They were all captured with only one making it over the wall. None of them suffered any life-threatening injuries. They were all brought to South 1 during the period that I had started a food strike. We were in our fourth day of not eating anything and demanding better conditions. Anytime they brought us food, we refused and it had to be documented. After four days, they had to bring doctors in to monitor our vital signs. Then after a week, they had to send a report to the mayor. We also had people on the outside calling the mayor's office. Once they brought those brothers into the block, we were immediately all placed into emergency transfer. Getting rid of me would end the hunger strike. Chapter 166, Sussex 1. The DC government had negotiated to have a supermax state prison in Waverly, Virginia, specifically built for us DC prisoners after the chaos in Lawton, the federal prisons in Youngstown, Ohio. The name of the prison was Sussex II. They already had a Sussex I supermax for unruly Virginia prisoners, so Virginia believed they could handle DC prisoners with this new type of supermax that restricted movement with a lot of separating fences and armed officers. It was a level five out of six, designed specifically for punishment and restriction. Sussex 2 wasn't finished being built, so they negotiated on having us held at Sussex 1 until 2 was completed. It was only 12 of us that would be coming from South 1. 11 lifers from the escape attempt and me, still serving a five-year parole violation. It was a three-hour drive into Sussex County, Virginia. We knew we were entering into a totally different system. Virginia has always been known as an uber-racist apartheid state. Most people from D.C. stayed out of Virginia because of the fascist-type police system they employed. Once the bus pulled up, it was surrounded by tobacco-chewing cops and cowboy hats. Our reputation as 
hardest to handle, extremely dangerous, worst of the worst, etc. So we were treated as such. We were strip searched, reissued a set of state issued blues, a new ID with a new prison number. Every time you entered into a new institution, this was standard procedure with the exception of a new number. That only happened when you were moved into a new system. Example, federal, state. I had a Lawton DC number which was different from my federal number which was different from my Virginia state system number. We were then shackled and handcuffed again with two officers walking with each of us. One grabbed under my left arm and the other grabbed under my right arm and we walked onto a compound with them speed walking and technically dragging us. It was nighttime and this place looked like a brightly lit college campus except the building windows were narrow and menacing and the fences were everywhere to partition the yard. We were dragged for what seemed like 20 minutes with the shackles cutting into our ankles. We were being taken to the hole which was conveniently situated right next to the death row block. Inside the cell block they had a bubble in the center that was surrounded by cells like Ohio. But the difference here is the bubble had open windows and the officer stood guard with a shotgun in his hand. They had rubber bullets and live ammunition. The live ammunition was used if an officer was being assaulted, if weapons were being used in an assault, or if the rubber bullets didn't stop an assault or an escape attempt. The officer stood guard with the shotgun 24 hours a day even though we were locked down for 23 hours each day. The cells were clean and the steel beds had four steel loops two at each end. They were there in case we caused problems. They could forcefully enter into our cell and tie us down in a four-point restraint. If you were placed on restraint, you were fed twice a day something called a loaf. It was all the normal food mixed together and freeze-dried. It had no taste and was like a large cracker with no salt. They entered into the cell every six hours to loosen the strap so you could use the toilet and eat the loaf before being tied down again in 20 minutes. Any fighting against being tied down was met with pepper mace and 72 additional hours of restraint. You were placed on four point restraint for failure to follow rules in the hole like banging on the cell doors, yelling and attempting to destroy the cell. I was placed on four point restraint for two days for dumping my food on the tear as soon as the officers opened the tray slot. I was protesting how small the tray was. Kids in elementary school got more food than us. The cells had a bright light on the middle of the wall that stayed on 24 hours a day. At night it was like daytime. Sleeping became a challenge. Since the Bible was the only book we were allowed to have, I would tear pages out of it and use it to cover the lights. Then when the officers complained, I would take it down then put it back up when they left. One day, looking out the window to the recreational dog cages, the death row prisoners were out and I saw one of my homies from around my way. Oh shit. I knocked on the window. He looked up and had the biggest smile in the world. We hadn't seen each other in years and I didn't know he was in Virginia on death row. Fuck you doing on death row, homie? Long story. The homie caught a body while serving time in another Virginia prison and that is what placed them there. We laughed and made jokes about the electric chair. Hey homie, I heard your eyeballs pop out when they hit the switch. Cracked up into a deep laugh. His death sentence was reversed and he was eventually released from prison after serving 28 years. Chapter 167 Ty One day my neighbor Ty decided he was tired of the disrespect in this bullshit prison. He was used to surfing time in places like Lawton where we ran the prison. The prison didn't run us. This system was going to have to be broken. He decided since they weren't going to cut the lights off inside of our cells, he wasn't taking the Bible paper off of his light anymore. Ty had been in prison for 25 years and was almost 50 years old with a 65 year sentence. First, an officer during the prisoner head count asked him to take it off. He refused. They then sent in the counselor. Ty refused. They then sent in a the lieutenant. 
Ty refused again. Even a few other convicts yelled out to Ty asking him to take it down. He refused. Finally, they sent in the captain and his squad. They practically begged him to take it off after their demands fell on deaf ears. Ty yelled through the vents. Twin, fuck these people. I'm ready to go. Whatever gonna happen, gonna happen. I'm ready. I'm not tolerating them disrespecting me anymore. I'm a man. They either gonna turn the lights out or they gonna have to kill me. And with those last words, his decision was solidified. I supported it. Every man get to his breaking point at different times. And when they get there, it's time to go all out. Lee's law. A made up mind is a hard thing to change. The goon squad was called and they lined up in the bullet knife proof uniforms, shields, pepper mace and helmets. They were determined to show us who was in control and the power they were willing to wield for us to follow their rules. Our reputation of taking over prisons wherever we went had them overreacting to frivolous things. We weren't a slight bit intimidated. We were actually laughing at them. They looked like weak clowns. All of this for a few pieces of paper on a light fixture? Leave that man alone. The captain of the guards opened up Ty's trace slot and told him that if he didn't take the Bible paper down, they would have no choice but to enter into a cell and take it down themselves. He spoke respectfully and after 15 minutes of negotiations, Ty agreed to let them enter and take it down themselves because he wasn't going to take it down no matter what. And most likely, he was going to put it back up after they did. He had shoulder pain, so as part of his medical package, they had to cuff him in the front. He stuck both hands out of the trace slot, but before they cuffed him, Ty said he would only comply if the other officers stepped back. Out of respect, the captain ordered the officers from the goon squad to retreat back to the salad port, and only one other officer stayed with him. As they retreated, the armed officers standing guard in the bubble cocked their shotgun back and chambered around. As the cell door opened, Ty stepped out of the cell slowly walking backwards until he reached the two officers. The second officer held him by his arm while the captain went into the cell to remove the Bible paper from the light. Afterwards, the captain said to Ty, See how easy that was? Ty didn't respond. The captain then ordered the other officer to search Ty before placing him back into the cell. Ty started a conversation to distract the officers, but they were determined to search him. At that moment, one of the homies on the bottom tier started kicking on the cell door real hard, drawing the attention of the officers while Ty reached into his waistband with both hands and produced a seven inch knife. He cocked back and tried to slam it into the captain's neck. By pure luck, the captain threw his arm up real quick out of the natural reaction to block it. And because Ty was cuffed and swinging with both arms together with not a good footing, it wasn't as much force as one hand would have been. The lucky block was able to repel the attack. Within a second, the other officer grabbed Ty and they wrestled him down to the ground as the armed guard aimed the shotgun and the goon squad ran into the cell block full speed. They were able to get the knife from Ty and drug him back into a cell and the beating began. All I heard was thumps and groans, fists and feet hitting flesh. Motherfucker, you try to stab me? Thump, 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 thump. You try to stab me, motherfucker? Thump, thump, thump. You don't know who I am, motherfucker? They were beating Ty for so long that I walked away from my cell door and I laid down staring at the brightly lit 15 foot ceilings, uh, listening to the thumps. It was nothing I could do but listen. My secured cell was directly beside his so the sounds were so clear I could visualize it. My ankles were still swollen and my skin was still raw from the shackles. 
while I was resting my aches and pains, my homie was next door getting killed and I was useless in helping him. More officers ran into the block and into his cell. Kill this motherfucker. I stared at the ceiling thinking about my brother. He was locked down in a hole in Long Park Penitentiary in California. He had a long way to go before he would ever see society again. I felt more pain for him than he probably felt for himself. He was good, but I wasn't. I thought about hijacking a helicopter, loading it up with grenades and AK-47s with 100 round drums and go get him out of the penitentiary after I got out of the penitentiary. I would land a helicopter on the yard then pass him an AR-180 and we would open fire killing every prison guard we saw. Then we would fly away. Thump. 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 The walls were trembling. They were still beating tie next door. Thump. 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 Finally, after 15 minutes, the beating stopped. So I got out of the bed and walked to my cell door and looked out the window. It was 20 to 25 fully armed cops and they were dragging Ty on his back by his shackles, past my cell and down the tear. Ty was unrecognizable. His jaw was on the side of his face like he had a deformity and both of his eyes were swollen like vagina lips. His lips were like sliced peaches and even his ears looked like cauliflower. They dragged him down the stairs, legs first with the back of his head hitting every step and bouncing up like a basketball while leaving globs of blood on every step as they went. Once they got him to the bottom, they dragged him into the center of the cell block and the captain screamed at the top of his lungs. You motherfuckers think y'all gonna come into my prison with this bullshit? Huh? His eyes were red like a raging bull with slob running down the corners of his mouth. Everybody was standing at their cell doors looking at this spectacle. I'll kill all you motherfuckers. Every single one of you. He pointed at every person from DC standing in our cells looking out and skipped over the prisoners from Virginia. This was reminiscent and almost deja vu of what happened in Marion Penitentiary in 1982 to the homie Raymond Cadillac Smith. I wasn't there but the story is legendary in the penitentiary and numerous books are written about it. He was killed by two Aryan Brotherhoods, Tommy Silverstein and Clayton Fountain, and they dragged him onto the terror while the killer threatened everyone from D.C. That incident culminated into a decades-long war between D.C. convicts and the Aryans, with multiple deaths on both sides. The officers at this prison were incensed that their invincibility was shattered at the finding of a 7-inch Bethlehem. These supermax prisons were funded and approved by the government based on their supposedly security against such acts. This incident would definitely land on a politician's desk and they're going to want answers. A few people may even lose their jobs. They couldn't figure out how Ty was able to smuggle the knife past the supermax at DC jail through multiple extensive strip searches and metal detectors and into this supermax state prison. They even had an x-ray chair that we had to sit on while it x-rayed our whole bodies. They wanted to know how Ty did it, but not one DC prisoner even allowed them to take them into questioning. We all bucked and refused to cuff up. DC also had a reputation of retribution. If anyone did anything to someone from DC, we always retaliated, even if the incident was years apart. If we couldn't get to you, then one or a few of your homies would feel it. The officers knew this and they expected some form of retaliation. They didn't give us a chance. That night they came 30 deep like the SWAT team and took us all one by one to be removed from the prison and be sent to Sussex 2, which was across the street, and also not yet finished being built like when I was sent to Youngstown, Ohio. I never saw a tie again. He was returned back to DC custody and kept at DC General Hospital until he healed up. 
Unfortunately, Ty never made it home. Years later, he killed a white boy at Pollock Penitentiary in Louisiana and was then killed by one. Unfortunately, the homie Mario never made it home either. He was also killed in Pollock. 